We've got a lot of exciting things to cover this morning, and so let's go ahead and get with it. We are in the second week of a very brief two-week series called Invest and Invited. Last week, we spoke of the principle of investing, so I'll let you guess where we're headed this morning in this brief two-week series called Invest and Invite. But I want you to go ahead, if you've got a Bible, let's turn to John chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We just make it a habit here. Keep them up high. We're about to just hand you a Bible. We want you to be able to track with us this morning. Hands up high. Bibles are coming down the aisles as we speak. Getting a little bit early to this point. Volunteers this morning, sorry. But like I said, we've got a lot to cover. So the jokes are going to go by the wayside this morning. You're okay with that. I know they're not really funny, but it helps me build confidence. John chapter 4. So when you get one of those Bibles, feel free to always use the table of contents here. We'll have the words on the screen, but we want you to be able to follow along with us where we're headed. In John chapter 4, John is in the New Testament. It sits between the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And so when you get to the New Testament, um, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. So we're in John chapter 4. We'll start in verse 27. So if you want to find your place there. And then what we're doing this morning, there's a beautiful story that occurs in John chapter 4, a really beautiful story, and we're actually going to break down that story two weeks from today, on September 25th, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But what I want to concentrate this morning is on the after story, it's sort of like the after party. Uh, I've never been invited to an after party, I've never been invited to a party, but uh, if you guys get an invite, and uh, it's one of the cool ones to invite your pastor to, uh, email me. I'm not up for lame parties or lame after parties, but if you've got a good one to invite your pastor to, hit me up. And, uh, and if I tell you that I've got to do something with my kids that night, it just means that your invitation is a little late. So, just so you know, I like to share my strategies for how I communicate with you guys by way, way of email. Man, it's fun to see a full room. Fun to see a full room this morning. So, uh, John chapter 4, we'll get to verse 27. I do want to give you some highlights, uh, just some momentary highlights of the big story that's in the chapter, and then we're going to concentrate elsewhere. So in this chapter, Jesus has begun his earthly ministry, and he, because he's fully human, fully God, he is worn out. And so he finds himself in Samaria, in a town called Sychar, and he, he's there, and he's worn out from the ministry and just the pace he's been going at. It's an amazing thing, and if you think you can continue to go without resting, then you got one up on Jesus. Just probably don't put that on your resume. Like, hey man, I don't need as much rest as Jesus said. Like, that would be a terrible, terrible thing. And so Jesus is resting. He's at a well. It's, it's called Jacob's Well there. And it's about noontime. And what happens is this woman, who's a Samaritan woman, obviously, so he's in Samaria. She comes to draw water with her water jar on this specific, specific day. And so she's there, and Jesus is there. And Jesus says to her, can I have a drink of water? She replies in this way. She says, how in the world, essentially, how in the world can you, a Jewish man, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? Because in that day, in that culture, Samaritans and Jews didn't mix, and men and women in a public setting did not mix. And so what she's, she's thrown off initially that Jesus has even spoken to her. Something big for you and I to know that Jesus doesn't, um, he, he's not concerned with where you and I come from. Not demographically, not geographically, not how, how dark the road is in your past. He's not concerned with those things. He wants to be in on our lives. And so a huge just lesson right there that she gets from him. So he, he asks for a drink of water, and then she says to him, uh, he, like, how are you talking to me? And then he says to her, if you knew who it was that asked you for a drink, you would ask me for a drink. And then he begins to tell her that when you continue to drink this physical water, you always come up thirsty again. So she's always, like daily or every couple of days, however long the water runs out, she's bringing her water jar back to him. And he says, you have to keep coming back to this. But I've got something that will satisfy not your physical thirst eternally, but I've got something that will satisfy your soul's thirst forever and ever and ever. And Jesus wasn't simply talking about the water. He wasn't just talking about satisfaction. He knew something about this lady. And he told her this. He said to her, the reality is for your life in regards to this soul's thirst thing, the reality is for your life that you've had five husbands and now you're living with a man who isn't your husband. So what he understands about this woman is what he understands about you and I. The series that we begin next Sunday, here it is. You and I are always chasing things, believing that the thing we're chasing is going to satisfy us. Okay? All of us. You have your thing. If it's success, we're going to talk about that. If it's sex, we're going to talk about that. Have your children. Um, 
Not really. I mean, we'll talk about that October 2nd. Uh, if it's relationships, it, it, if it is money, whatever it is that you and I get in our minds that, hey, that thing's going to do it for us finally, we, we spend any amount of money it takes to get it, we pursue it, we stay up at night thinking about how can we get it because we bought into the belief that whatever it is that we're chasing is finally and eventually going to satisfy us. And so for her, she constantly was seeking fulfillment in all of these relationships with all of these men. And Jesus says, I, I've got something for you that's better than a sixth husband or a seventh husband. I've got something for you that will be more satisfying, more fulfilling. And so that's what happens. And then she understands, because Jesus knows her history, she, she understand he must, understands he must be a prophet. And she says to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. I, I know. She, she understands prophecy. She, she's understood some of that. She says, I, I know that the Messiah is coming. And Jesus cuts straight to her heart with these words. He says, she says, I know the Messiah is coming. And Jesus says, I who speak to you and he. I who speak to you and he. So her mind is just blown, as your mind would be, right? You think you're just meeting someone who's the opposite gender and the opposite from a different culture than you are. And by the time you leave this encounter, the conversation, you're going, oh my gosh, maybe he's the Messiah. That's sort of a big deal, right? I mean, tell me your favorite celebrities right now. We will not condemn you in this room. Just give me all three of your favorite celebrities. One, two, three. Say it loud. It's like, listen, we don't have a Sunday life and then a Monday through Saturday life. So give me your best Monday through Saturday favorite celebrity to follow. Hey, <laughs> Three of you have people you look up to. That, that's awesome. That's great. Um, so we have this still a church we call Honesty. And uh, so I ask a question, you guys let me know the answer. So I'm not, anyway, I, I've got a friend in the room. I'll just click on him this morning. He, he really looks up to Kanye. Oh. Don't you fall. Falling in our tight, so don't worry, he's good. Uh, but we have people to come to. So imagine you're 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 one like you've heard about someone coming, but this isn't a celebrity, this is the Messiah that you've heard about. And you're a Samaritan, so you already have a belief that you're not good enough for that Jewish Messiah. And you also have a belief that you have a lifestyle that is not good enough for you to ever encounter the Messiah. And all of a sudden, this woman's going, wait, he didn't condemn me? He didn't judge me? And let's see what he does, or what she does, and what the effect is that this has on her. And my prayer is that this might have a similar effect on you and I, when we truly encounter Jesus as he really is, and, and what his approach is to us. So in 27 through 30, would you guys stand? Just let's honor God's word for this first passage here. So remember, she has just heard, I can speak to you and me, and here we go, 27 through 30. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with the woman. There's a clue right there. Even the disciples of Jesus were blown away that Jesus was speaking to a woman. So if you don't think it was a big cultural deal, it was such a cultural deal that even the followers of Jesus who lived closely to him were blown away that he was speaking with a woman. This is huge. So they're like, why is he speaking with the woman? But no one said, what do you see? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. You may be seated, and I pray that God will bless his word this morning, as he promised to do. So this woman is so blown away with the experience that she's just had. There's one thing that she came to the well to do that day. What was it? Water, right? She's got her water jar. That is the, probably the only thing she's carrying. So she's come to the well for one reason, really obvious reason, is to get water and to bring it back. It's just to grab the water and to take it back home, something she does on a daily or semi-regularly basis, regular basis. But she's so uh, thrown off by the conversation Jesus just had with the possible Messiah that the text says she leaves her water jar there and she goes into her town, so out away from the <coughs> well area. She goes back into town and she tells everyone about the guy that she's just met. Now here's something really interesting to note. She's not been with him very long, has she? She doesn't have a history with him, yet she's encountered enough about him to be able to go back and say to her people, Come see a man. Come see a man who told me everything that I've ever done in my life. Now, for some of us, if you have any history like me, you don't want to see a person who knows everything you've ever done in your life, do you? I mean, how many of you would stay seated if I got the popcorn and soda machine going and we watched like your 10 worst moments ever, right here on the Sunday? Who's up for that? Who's staying? None of us are. None of us are. 
But here's one thing interesting. Because some of us, when we encounter God and the possibility that God exists, we walk away going, I feel completely guilty and filled with shame because I have just... And, and there is a holiness, obviously, to God. But she doesn't walk away feeling shame. She's encountered the real Jesus. She doesn't walk away feeling guilty. She's probably blown away that she doesn't. So she's like, this could be the Messiah. So she just naturally has this encounter. And then she goes to her people and she says, you've got to come see this man. She just makes an invitation. And it says in verse 30, so they went out of the town and they were coming to him. Like she just says, hey, you've got to come. And, and he comes to her. They come to see him. They come to see Jesus. Now, one of the things that I believe, and I think it's starting to hold true. We've said from the beginning as a staff here at Epic. That when people became confident enough in what God was doing in our church and confident enough to invite their friends to experience what God was doing, we honestly said to each other in one of our strategy meetings that, that we believe the tipping point could come at that time. And so it's thrilled us lately as you told us how you found out about the church. Certainly Google, we do that. We send out flyers. We send out, we're going to hand you an invite card this morning. We do all those things. So we'll continue to do it. But we've been seeing more and more of you tell us, hey, I brought three coworkers with me or my neighbors here this morning. And so we really believe that when we begin to say to things like people, hey, come and see what God is doing here. Because here's the deal. And what I want to say clearly with my lips, our hope is that you would love our church. But our hope is that you would not love our church more than you love Jesus. And, and my hope as a pastor, and I've even said this to our staff this week, some of them. I said, I cannot be a pastor that leads you to love our church at the expense of not loving who he is. And so I want to be real clear about that. If that's like weird, how do you love someone you can't? I, we'll, get, we'll unpack that in the coming days. But my, but my hope is that our church would be an incredible means to an end of that. Right? My, my hope is that our church would be so full of God's presence, so full of people who are laying down their lives to advance the mission that God's given to our church in the city of San Francisco, that you and I would be willing to go, you know what? I want other people to come see it. Not come see or hear me, but could, could it be a means by which we are introducing them to who God is and what he's up to? If you go down to verse 39, again, John chapter 4, verse 39 through 42. Words on the screen this morning, so feel free to look at any of our screens. Again, just hear the effect that, that her encounter with Jesus has. And I just wonder, what if um, our encounters with Jesus had the same effect? <coughs> verse 39, it says, Men, we'll just go one verse at a time. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So right off the bat, she goes and she tells him, listen, I think this is the Messiah. He like, told me everything I ever did. And it doesn't say this in the text, but it, it can't just be that she's excited that he told me everything I ever did. Because for us, it's not enough that God knows who we are, right? If he's not going to do anything about it, who cares what he knows about us? That may sound bold to you this morning, but I feel that way. If, if he knows what we've done, great. Right? It's one thing for you to know my situation, but you're, if you're not helping me, I've, I've got no time for you. So she, 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 she's in, in a sense, she's going, he knows everything I've ever done, and yet he didn't condemn me. He, he knows everything that I've done, and yet he didn't judge me in the moment. He knows everything that I've done, and I just felt compassion and grace and love and mercy flowing out of his voice. Like, no, no other Jewish man would speak to me, and yet the Messiah, who knows everything about me, he spoke to me softly. Some of us have never encountered that Jesus. Maybe you grew up in a tradition or in a church that painted a different picture for you. But maybe you, you just, you've just met so many Christians, and I want to use quotes loosely, Christians, and you're like, I, I can't imagine ever wanting any, any kind of Jesus like that. Well, she doesn't have all these preconceived notions. She does, and then Jesus actually whittles away at them. But then she walks away going, and he told me everything that I've ever done. And yet he wasn't harsh with me. Yet he offered me something that would satisfy me. He did try to give me a pep talk on how to get this marriage thing right the sixth time. Right? There's something loving, obviously, in his eyes. There was something engaging about him. Engaging about him so much that she was willing to leave and go, Hey, I want all of you to know. And you got to understand this. It was such an incredible encounter. These people did not have good opinions of this woman. Right? And, and so, listen, when we typically think, I can't invite that person to church, they hear how I talk at the office, well, talk better, clean up. But your reputation is not what we're trying to, to, to attach them to here. We're trying to attach them to the God who loves them. 
And can you just be honest this morning and go, hey, I don't always get it right? If you can't be honest, uh, tell your neighbor and we'll all say it to you. You don't get it right. I don't get it right. No matter what my title is, I don't always get it right. I need a God that approaches me with love and compassion. I need a God, as the scriptures say, who is slow to anger. He's patient with us, not wanting any of us to perish without him. But to embrace him, to know who he is. And, and so she says, regardless of my reputation, you guys got to hear this. I've met a man who could be the Messiah. In verse 40, it says, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. This is really big, big news. So Jesus' public ministry lasted about three years before he was crucified. And, and I tell you that to say, if you and I, we say this a lot in here, you and I think we are so busy we don't have time for what we would call important things, right? We also made the case last week that if you uh, were invited to something that you really loved and valued, you would, you would do whatever you could to make that happen. True? Right? You know, like all the celebrities you don't like, what if they were outside the door? Right? Like all the ones that you don't care about, like you don't follow, you don't read their Twitter, you don't, uh, you know, anyway, well, I'm not going to get into things that we did you guys this morning. When, when, we, when we want something and when you value something, we make time for it. If anyone had a mission to go accomplish, if anyone had a busy season of life, it is a Messiah. Can we agree with that? Like, I know you're like, oh, but Ben, I work at Apple. All right, he's the Messiah. Like, but no, man, I'm starting this new thing all by myself. I've got, I can't have time for anything else. Um, he's coming to save the world. Right? You're, you're like, but Ben, I've got children. And I don't have nannies like everybody else does in the city. He's the Messiah. He's on a mission, and ours doesn't really compare to his, all right? And yet Jesus does something amazing. This Jewish Messiah spends two days in verse 40 with these men and women. In case you don't know this Jesus, this Jesus is a God who makes time even for me and you. He gave 48 hours just to answer their questions. Just to answer their questions. He wants to interact with us. So whatever lies you believe based on your past or what you've been taught, I just want to reintroduce you to the idea of a God who in the flesh, Jesus, does want to spend time with us. Verse 41. And many more believe because of his word. Verse 42. They said to the woman, and it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, this is what's awesome. They say, listen, it's no longer because of your story, right, your testimony, your uh, explanation of what he did in your life. It's now because we've heard for ourselves, we've, we've experienced it ourselves, we've interacted with him, and now our faith is that much greater. But here's the deal. Do they ever get to that point with Jesus if she doesn't say to them, come see? Let me let you off the hook this morning. Your job is not to convince anyone about who Jesus is. Seriously, let, let's, let, let's let the pressure evaporate in the room this morning. Your job, if, if you are a Christian or if you're going to become one or if you never become one, your job would never be to convince people who he is. But it's an incredible privilege this woman takes and you and I can take to introduce people to who he is. Share part of the story last week. So we opened this building three weeks ago. We'll talk more about that in a moment. We opened this building three weeks ago and one of our volunteers, a lot of our volunteers work to make this space look good. Doesn't it look, isn't it so good here? And you guys haven't even seen it before. Before we were like, oh my gosh, what, what are we going to do? We've got lights hanging below here. Like, there's a reason we never let you see it before, okay? <laughs> there's a reason why, like, that we've deleted the before pictures. Um, because we, we knew that, that it could be awesome, but it wasn't as awesome at the time. And so a lot of people helped us get this space ready. And one of our volunteers, when we opened the space, August 21st, she invited a coworker, hey, would you come and be a part of... Uh, this big day of helping get this space ready. Would, would you come and help us out with this and, and just celebrate with me personally? And, and her friend didn't have a great view of churches or Christians, only had been to church as a child on Easter and Christmas. Uh, but for the sake of this volunteer and the friendship, she, she came on August 21st. And, and what's crazy is that um, she didn't have a great view of Christians and wasn't looking forward to what would be happening in this room. And, um, she leaves the room that morning in tears. And she says that she felt like God was speaking directly to her that morning. Now, our volunteer had a role, but she didn't have all of it, did she? Here's what's amazing. The whole time that person was hearing from God, maybe for the first time in her life, she would say, not us putting words in her mouth. This volunteer was actually working in Epic Kids. But she made the introduction. She literally made the invite. She said, hey, would you come? And our volunteer, she did an incredible job, but she didn't change her heart. 
She didn't move in her heart. She didn't do it. She wasn't even in the room. And I know they weren't text messaging because you can't get cell service down here in AT&T. So I know that would happen. <laughs> All of you are frustrated because you, you, you like, can't get on your phones during the boring part of the message this morning. Like, ah. No, you can't unless you've got Verizon. Or something else. But I just wonder, as I, as I think about what God can do here, and I don't mean here just in this room. I mean in our city. I mean in the Bay Area. I mean in the world. And, and what, what's incredible um, is that we have uh, we have about I don't know twenty sometimes up to twenty five different uh, countries represented in, in the room. So if, if you're not from America, would you stand up? And we just want to like clap loud for you um, being a part of that. What we see really is this incredible potential for a global awakening happening right here. City in the cave, as some of you call it, downtown San Francisco. I don't know what the earthquake plan is, all right? I know some of you are freaking out about that. I don't know. <laughs> now we need to develop one before, uh, before we do this again. Um, but our hope is that if, if, if really God was moving in our midst here and, and you were experiencing that and you were... You, that, that the only thing that you would be led to do, the only effect that it could have is for you to go to your coworkers and friends and people you're meeting in different places and as you as you become hospitable and people who move in around you, they could be able to go, hey, I, I don't know if you're a religious type person or not. In fact, I go to a church that we don't really even celebrate religion, do we? Right? We don't, we're not religious people. That's not our aim. Um, but, but, uh, but there's some really neat things going on. Would you just come with me one time? Like, would you get one hour? Or, or would you come to my small group? Maybe they're, they're more comfortable in a smaller setting. Uh, would, would you do that? We believe in it. Our church doesn't have the answers for the world, but we know the one who does, and we're asking if he would come and do something really special in our midst. And it all starts with her saying to the rest of the people in Samaria, we should just come see. That's all she said. She didn't have years of spiritual growth behind her. She didn't hang with Jesus for once. She met him one day, she's blown away by the experience, and she goes, you guys have to come meet this man. And perhaps if that effect's not happening for you or for me, perhaps we need to get reacquainted with who he is and the fact that he desires us and the fact that he's not counting our past against us. And as we say here a lot, our past doesn't have to dictate our future. So when we really encounter him, she's not so concerned with her past. She's more concerned about other people hearing about what he's done as they move forward into the future. There's three things that were in your program. So if you guys will, will turn to those, those, it's not like an addition. This is part of the message this morning, and then we're going to shift gears just a bit. But first, you, you hopefully got it. This isn't just an epic thing, so if you're just checking our church out, you're not committing to anything here. But this is just a way for us to be reminded of who people are that God's placed in our life, reminding us simply to pray for them, to invest in them, like take them to lunch, coffee, and then invite them into something. It can be a worship service if that's how they would better enjoy that because they want to be anonymous. It could be your small group. It could just be some, uh, go to a baseball or football game with your friends. I mean, what, whatever it is. No, we won't pay for that, but you need to pay for theirs, right? Um, you, you need to take care of that. Um, so, I, I, and you don't have to come up with 10. I've got six on my list right now. People that I'm praying for every day this past week, this coming week, and people that I'm going to invite to be a part of this next series. Also, so just keep that as a reminder. Keep it somewhere you can see it. Also, we have these invite cards. Literally, if you um, aren't at a place where you want to speak to people about inviting them, we think that's best, word of mouth. Uh, when they go to the restroom at the cubicle next to you, just lay it out there, right? But I don't know where that came from. Um, but a better way, a better way, especially if you have a good relationship with them, uh, just, just to go, hey, here's what we're doing over the next uh, five or six weeks. Uh, why don't you come check it out when you get a chance? It might be on the 18th when we start. It, it may not be. But we want to equip you guys so that you can um, be well equipped to make that invitation. And then I wrote a prayer guide for our church for the next seven days. In fact, it's not just a prayer guide. I actually wrote the prayers. And here's why I did that. Not because I don't think you can pray, but I know some of you, this is a new exercise and a new discipline. And so I would just like to ask all of you, whether you're a praying type of person or not, would you just pray these? This will take less than a minute or about a minute every day. You certainly can add to these prayers. But just prayer specifically, as we head into this next Sunday, September 18th is a huge fall kickoff for us. This week we've got people from other churches around the country that will be inviting people at, at different transit stops. So when you see them, tell them hi. Tell them you go to Epic. I mean, be nice, all right? 
Uh, please. And, uh, and we've got 35,000 piece mailer that's hitting uh, mailboxes tomorrow and Tuesday. So if you live in Soma, I'll be looking for that. Uh, if you don't, uh, we'll give you some of the rejection once we get to that address. So just let us know. Of course, it'll be three months too late. But um, and, and then we pray this with us. So like, just, just you can see the different focuses throughout the prayers as you do these. Would you guys commit to doing this with us just in one week? Like, uh, maybe it'll become a, a pattern or habit for you. But just come into praying with us for for the next week. And um, we'd love for you guys to do that. And I do want to shift gears for, for a moment. Um, we believe, in, and we're overwhelmed with this, that God's doing something pretty special here at our church right now. And uh, couldn't be more excited that you're part of it, even if it's just for the first time, or maybe you're saying right now for the only time. But we, we couldn't be more excited about, about what God's doing and, and about what we sense God doing. And so I, I just want to recap some things for you and then kind of show you what's going on in, in the near future. So um, the dream, the dream was really implanted in my heart by God in the fall of 2008, that, that God would lead us to start a church that people like you would want to attend, that God would lead people like you to discover the reality of who God is in their life, that people like you would come, because here's one thing we knew as we researched and studied, and you know this about San Francisco, when things begin here, it travels so much further around the world than almost any other place in the world that I know. And not only does it travel globally, but it also travels deep into the future. You can see that with fashion, you can see that with technology, you can see it with finance, you can see it with, go on and on and on and on. And so our big dream was that God, if you would lead us, and then it became a part of my wife's dream, and then our, our staff today became part of their heartbeat, and other people who joined us in the initial uh, startup phase and joined the launch team, it became part of our dream that God, if it's a strong church and many churches could start here, God, could they advance deep into the future and could they advance globally? And one of the reasons I had many of you stand up is because some of you are going to go back to the countries in which you originated from. And so what if God would begin a movement? I mean, what if we had epic branches all over Africa? That'd be cool. All right. Is that okay? Andre, can you handle that? Can your people back home handle that? Um, and, and who knows what God will do? I just know that if God would give us favor and if God would bless and if he would bring people who would be confident in what he was doing here. And then on February 13th, just a little less than the seven months this Tuesday, on February 13th, we launched the church. And so the launch happens and we're praying and you're dreaming. And if you're starting a church as a pastor, you, it doesn't matter how long you go, at least in this initial stage, you're still wondering, is anyone showing up the next morning? Right? And so you have bad dreams about it. Then you get there and like, okay, one person's here, we're good. Because um, I worked really hard this week. And so, um, and so we launched the church, and it's full down at the Delby Hotel, and people are everywhere, and there's kids going everywhere, and people are being introduced to who we are, and, and, and hopefully to God for the first time. And, and then there were some trials that came our way, and, and on Sunday night, March 20th, about 25 of our leaders sat in our living room and just said, God, would you give us a space? Like, we lost our contract, and so we were just getting an email from the hotel, and, and, and they, were just, they were doing good business on their end, but it was affecting us in crazy ways. So we just began to pray, God, would you grant us space? And, and we uh, were very specific. I have a friend who's taught me to be real specific with our requests. And so we kind of said, God, we want it to be uh, from Embarcadero to 4th Street, uh, between Market and King Street. Uh, some of you are like, I need to be praying more specifically. Yeah, you do. You never know who you're going to marry if you don't pray real specific, right? I mean, you can always color her hair if she's not blonde like you pray. But, uh, so we, we've been praying real, real specifically. And, uh, and, and then we were introduced to the space. It just so happened that God brought a person who's a leader here in Epic who works for a firm, a real estate firm. Yeah, it just so happens. That, um, and he discovered the space. And so we see the space. We like it. We think about what it could be. And, um, and, and they want way too much money for it. And so we're like, we can't do that. And, and so then what happens is that we begin to negotiate. And they bring the price down into what we think we can chew off. Like, we can have, we can pay that much. And as soon as we agree to it, there's no contract at this point. As soon as we agree to it, we get word that the owner of the building is selling the building. And, you know, we didn't have $35 million, So, uh, not for this space, it's the whole building. You're like, what's this worth? Uh, and, and so we just began praying. I remember walking by this building so many times and just continuing. Like, we didn't go after anything else during that season. Just beginning to pray, God, we believe that you have given this space to us. And I didn't have an audible word from God. I didn't like, oh, I know for sure. Um, but I just sensed when I would walk by this building. And then we get an email. There's plenty of buyers, by the way, that want to buy the building. And unbeknownst to us or him, why, the, the owner takes it off the market. And then comes back to us at the price we had agreed to that we could afford. And, um, and then if you don't know what... How these things go with buildings. It's crazy to try to get a permit. And so this building was, uh, the, the room you and I sit in, if it wasn't, uh, 
If it didn't have the assembly permit, then only 49 of us could be in here this morning. And so it already had the permit that, that we needed. We didn't have three or four months to go. We didn't know like, how long could we stay where we were. And, and then also when you move into a new space, typically you have to go in and design the rooms that fit what your organization, your business, or in our case, your church is. Well, guess how the rooms are already designed? We already had the worship space we needed. We already had the three kids' spaces we needed. They gave us exclusive access to the kitchen. They gave us super nice bathrooms that we did two or three years ago. So we didn't have to do any of those things. Now, if you're like, I don't know if God's really in this. Well, listen, if you could see our journals, if you could have heard our prayers, we were desperate. We couldn't make this happen on our own. None of us were spiritual enough. None of us had construction knowledge enough. Trust us. If you could have seen this, you would have known. Um, and so God did that did that for us throughout the search. And then we opened this building three weeks ago today. It's crazy. It's already becoming home for us. And, um, I can't tell you how overwhelmed we are with what God's doing and how He's setting things up. And over the last couple of weeks, just to let you know the reality of where we are, um, Lindsay, who leads our Epic Roots ministry, we, we throw goals out all the time as a team. And, and she says she would love to have 150 people sign up for an Epic Group. I'm like, that's not possible. And uh, But anyway, as of this morning, there's about 140 Adults only, just adults. A lot of kids part of it too, but only 140 adults already. And uh, and uh, yeah, take us over the over the line this morning. Uh, so it's crazy. We're having a close rooms. We're like, did we get enough? And so anyway, it's just it's just amazing to see what God's done. It's all right. We did pay the light bill this first year. <laughs> but um, so that's been amazing. Another pretty incredible thing is that over the last three weeks, we've had 90 first time guests here at Epic. And just people that have identified themselves as first-time guests. And so God is doing some things to grow our church, and we're grateful for that. And because of the growth that's currently going on, and because of the growth that we anticipate in the very near future, we want to announce to you guys this morning that two weeks from today, we're starting a second service. Woo! Doing the study that we did, they told us 6.38 a.m. was the best time to start this. <laughs> So it will, it will, the two services will occur at 9.30 and 11 a.m., starting just two weeks from today. And, and so let me tell you a little bit why, why that's huge for us. Uh, it, it gives us a chance really to uh, multiply some things, and it gives us a chance initially to, uh, to double some things. And I'll show you guys on the screen some things that we're able to double right away. The first thing is that we're able to double our seating capacity. Uh, about 200 chairs in here right now, and there's about 10 people standing up, just so you know. I mean, there are some chairs throughout. I don't know if some people stink or put the odor on, but um, it allows us to double our seating capacity from about 200 just in this room to 400. And if you don't know why, it's just, you know, times two. Um, and, and it also allows us to double our Epic Kids capacity. Now, one thing that's going to be different than the rest of the kids' ministry is that our 5 to 10-year-olds are only going to meet during the 11 a.m. time frame starting two weeks from today. But we've been praying for that ministry to grow. Really, it's been uh, my kids, Brad kids, and a couple other kids. And so last week, we had 10 kids in the, in the 5 to 10-year-old room, which was huge. It's a, it's a personal prayer for Shauna and I that our kids would love the church experience. And, uh, and so new friends helps them to love, love that more. And so we're really excited about that. It doubles the opportunity to, to be able to have more um, 0 to 23 months old, and uh, as well as the 2 to 4-year-olds. It's such a huge. It obviously doubles our time options. So some of you have said to us, hey, I would love to have an earlier service to go see the 49ers play or to go catch my football team or whatever. So you've got that. Uh, you, you've got that opportunity for whatever the reason. Some families have said that 930 would work better with nap schedules and feeding schedules. So, so, so you've got that. But it also does this for us. It doubles the number of volunteer opportunities. And really a vision we want to cast. Because remember when... Um, when we started this, I'll talk about that in a second, but we, we would love for some of you to go, you know what, I can attend one of the services and serve during the other one. So just a great opportunity to when you volunteer, because you're all going to sign up to volunteer this morning, if you didn't know, when you walked in. Um, it gives you a chance to attend one of the services and volunteer at, at one of the other services. So that's, that's huge. And speaking of uh, new volunteer opportunities, let me remind you, if you're old to this thing, sort of old, we're not going to have a lot of history here. Uh, or if you're here for the first time this morning, I want to tell you how this thing began. Uh, this thing began, and we, we made it to this place so far, because when this thing kicked off, uh, there were about 15 adults that would leave their homes at about 5.30 every morning and hop on a bus or a train or a bicycle or a car, or for me, my two feet, and uh, and would walk down and unload a van and trailer at a time that you, like, you don't even know if God's awake, right? I mean, it's so early, like, I, I, I don't even 
even know if he's up. And uh, so unload the van and trailer, roll stuff in, um, take it up the surface elevators, go through the stinky trash room. Man, memories. And, and then you have to roll everything through the kitchen at the W. And so it was awesome to see what people had last night and the night before and the night before. And so then they would start, everybody would start plugging in cables. And I, I don't know where to plug in, but I can carry stuff. And so we're just plugging stuff in. They're getting soundboard ready. They're setting up the computer. We're making sure the chairs are in a way. People are putting up screens. And then they're rolling down to the Epic Kids room to, man, to put puzzle piece on the floor together. Whenever we did that, I don't know, but it was, it was fun. I just never wanted two colors of the same color next to each other. So, um, but people were sacrificing so that we could be ready by the time you got there. People were working. When we only had one hour, like like everything up until the 25th, when we only had one worship service, if people worked in Epic Kids, they had to miss out on the service. Didn't you, Epic Kids volunteers? Did you, Epic Kids volunteers? Yeah, come on. And so um, so this is going to open up a whole new thing for them. But, but people, ever since the beginning, I believe God's blessed because you guys have been willing to sacrifice. You've been willing to lay down your life for the sake of other people. You've been willing to show up at crazy times. And by the way, they don't get to leave when the service is over. They have to stay till about 2 or 2.30 sometimes to be able to pack the van and trailer up. About an eight and a half hour day of physical labor on most of their days off. Well, you don't have to do that to go to the 9.30 service. But for some of you, we're going to ask you to sacrifice. Some of you, it's going to be convenient for others. We're going to ask you to sacrifice because today is one of those moments for our church. And here's the deal. Two services isn't the end for us, right? There's so much of it that's just the beginning for us. One of our five core values here at Epic is church multiplication because we believe that it's going to take many churches in San Francisco and the Bay Area to have the impact and influence that God wants to have here in our area. We believe that. But as far as Epic's part in that, we believe it's going to take many services at many campuses eventually to be able to carry out the vision and mission that God has given to our church. And so don't be like... Man, I guess I can get used to this as long as they don't do anything else crazy like that. We keep changing it all the time just to keep you moving, all right? We just, and not, not, not in vain. We, have, we think there's great purpose to this. Here's the deal. Our church, like I said, is seven months old this weekend. So why don't you just dream a little bit. Just turn your imaginations on. What could God do in ten years? It's like 20 times what we've had so far, Pastor. Just think along those lines. Think in the exponential way. Think in the, what happens in the book of Acts. What could God do in our church and in our city and our area and in the world in the next 10 years? Some of you are going, you know what? I'm not going to be here 10 years from now. Who knows if any of us? Don't you want to be a part of it? And have some part to play in it? Because here's what I believe. I hope you give your best to your families. Of course. I hope you give your best to your hobbies. Of course. I need to give some more best to some of the hobbies, but I hope you give your best to your businesses, your companies, your organizations, whatever your role is. If you're the janitor or if you're the CEO, I want you to give your best to all those things. But I believe that if you would go, you know what, I want to be a part of something like this. I believe that when you look back over your life's history, I honestly believe you'll look back at this moment in time and go, you know what, that, that is what gave me great joy. I have a friend in this room, and uh, I remember a conversation with her. And she's got a big job at a really incredible company. I know that's lots of you, but, but I remember a conversation with her. You know what she said to me? She said that this is what I love doing. Serving, getting up here early, staying late, going and buying cupcakes because Phil Green thought it would be great to get cupcakes at the grand opening. She said, this is what I love. This is what I love. And a prayer is that God would do something in your heart to ignite you to say, no, but I'm willing to do that. In a moment, our volunteers are going to pass out a card, and it looks like this. Don't pass out yet, volunteers. It looks just like this. Um, I cut these, so they're not straight, but that's all right. It's, got, it's a simple card, but it's got huge implications. It's just got a place for your name and email, a chance for you to circle which service that you'll be willing to go to starting on the 25th. We're going to pack this thing out next week, so uh, but the 25th, we'll have a, a little more space for everybody. Uh, which service you're willing to, to attend. And then it also has a box that you can check or put an X, whatever. This is like your preference. Um, It says, I would like to be added as a volunteer to help Epic make this transition to two services. We need about half of you to be willing to go to the 930. But we need a bunch of you to be willing to start volunteering. But I don't want to cast the vision that way and say, hey, I need a ton of you to volunteer and a ton of you to go to the 930. I want to do it this way. Do you want the incredible privilege that I assume it is for me 
do you want the incredible privilege to be able to go, you know what, I was a part of something bigger than myself. Got up a little bit earlier. I wasn't a people person, but I started volunteering. And if you're not a people person and you start volunteering, don't be a greeter, all right? <laughs> we got like some ways for you to work with your hands that, uh, you know, we don't want Mr. Grumpy Pants to uh, be the first person that someone sees. So, um, but we do believe that it would be an incredible privilege. So I'm not casting the need vision. It's there. We need it. We need lots of you. And we'll go that route. You know how it was in school? Like, who's going to work the math problem on the board for Mrs. Smith? If you didn't volunteer, you didn't call it out, right? So that we will go that route if we have to, all right? We will do that. I wear my khakis one day and seem official, and, um, and we'll do that. Um, but I pray that you guys will be willing. Now, this doesn't convince you. Like, we're not going to check, like, oh, man, they checked 930. They showed up at 11. Get them out of here. Uh, and there, there, will, there will be weeks where one thing will work better for you than the other. So we get that, but just predominantly. And just so you know, we're going to continue to cast this vision until we have enough balance. Because 11 o'clock, we know for people that are coming for the first time, that's more of an optimal time. Research tells us that. So we're going to continue to try to get seats emptied at 11 o'clock. So we'll be making space constantly for new people who want to experience what God's doing here. So, are you guys on board? All right. Volunteers, if you will go ahead and pass those cards out to them. Brad's going to play some music that's going to move you to check 930. <laughs> Seriously. I don't know what the notes are, Brad. Give them something that touches the heart. And just fill those out, and then, and then we'll receive our offering in just a moment. So get your communication card ready as well, as well as your tithes and offerings if you're a part of our body here at Epic. Just hold on to them until we give you further instructions. Giving. And if you're gone a lot on the weekends, but here during the week, I 
encourage all of us, but especially those of you who are at home on the weekends, join an epic group. Lots of different nights, lots of different locations. We've even got one north of the city in Mill Valley, and so just join those. And as your pastor, I just want to say I couldn't be more excited. So glad that it started with me and my wife and these couples that you've met and our staff. So glad you're in this with us. Let's move forward together. You guys good with that? All right.